Hello, welcome to the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. Today is Tuesday, October 17, 2023. Um, we start off our uh, meetings in public accounts by uh, reading the Statement of Purpose and Values. Uh, the Standing Committee on Public Accounts is dedicated to improving public administration in partnership with the Auditor General. The committee examines the administration of government policies, not the merit of it. The committee strives to achieve consensus in its decisions whenever possible. Members take a nonpartisan approach to the work of this committee. Um, so uh, my name is Gordon McNeely. I'm the chair of this committee, and I'd want to uh, welcome uh, the, the members here. We have Vice Chair uh, Sidney McEwen, uh, Member Carla Bernard, Observing Member Zach Bell, uh, Member Hal Perry, uh, Member Matthew McKay, Member Hilton McClellan, uh, and Member Peter Bevan Baker. So, um, uh, before I go to the agenda, I just want to add a request to wish uh, one of our hardworking staffs here in the in the room happy birthday, John Ross. Happy birthday uh, uh, to you in the booth. Um, so, with that said, um, can I get an adoption uh, of the agenda? Uh, Carla Benar, perfect. So today we've got two presentations, um, but we'll we'll start off with our first one and welcome our guests here today. Our, we're going to get a briefing on the UPI funding agreement by the Department of Workforce, Advanced Learning and, and Population. Um, so I'd like to um, welcome Marie, Aaron, and Nicole to uh, the, the committee. And um, uh, before you uh, get going or when I pass it over to you, just, just uh, state your name for Hansard and, and so that they can uh, know who the, the speakers are. And then take your time with your presentation. I'll allow maybe uh, one or two clarification questions during the presentation if needed, um, but we'll save our questions for the end of the presentation. So at this time, the, the floor is our guests. Thank you, Chair. And just as, as we get started, I'm Mary Hunter. I'm the Executive Director for Workforce Development. I just wanted to let you know that um, we're going through some succession planning in the department, so this traditionally wouldn't be a file that I would be involved in. Um, however, we had a retirement that took place in the spring of 2023, and I've been actively involved with the file in the department since that time. Um, I'm going to welcome the committee, uh, our membership team here, and let them introduce themselves. Maybe starting with you, Anne. Sure. Aaron Lawler, Manager of Financial Services for the Post Secondary and Continuing Education Division. And I'm Nicole Belfler, and I'm the Director of Post Secondary and Continuing Education. So, this will be uh, Nicole's leadership file um, after the calendar year for 2023, as she's the Director responsible for Post Secondary Education. Just a little bit of context as we start. Our Workforce Advanced Learning and Population Department is relatively new, spring 2023. Important for the six divisions that have come together that are really focused around people from workforce, from skills development and training to post-secondary education to recruitment. We like to refer to ourselves as the people department. So the six divisions that are noted on this slide really focus in on um, helping the province to become prosperous where people want to live, learn, and work and succeed in our province. So why are we here today? We're to talk about the University of Prince Edward Island and our department's role around the governance of the university. Um, so UPEI, as you're aware, it does fall under the University Act, which is a statute under the, the legislature. They are governed by both a board of directors, and, board of governors, sorry, and a senate. What is our role? And I think it's important to talk about what the provincial role is with respect to the public institutions around post-secondary. Um, so we have, we're fortunate to have three public sector institutions that operate in our province. Um, our role is to ensure a strong, sustainable post-secondary sector and more importantly, ensure that students have access to, to um, education in the province that is accessible and affordable. And a lot of our mandate you will see will talk around the, the affordability and the accessibility to students around the institutions. We have responsibility with UPEI to appoint nine members to their board of governors. What we're here to talk about today is we administer their funding agreements and we monitor their reporting. We ensure they adhere to the legislation. They table financial statements in the legislature on an annual basis. 
the institutions in PEI for post-secondary do require a lieutenant governor order and counsel when they are mortgaging, selling, transferring, purchasing, leasing property. They also require approval if they are borrowing any um, funding from lending institutions. And I think that's it's important to stress that we have been fortunate in PEI where our institutions have taken an approach to be modern. Um, when you look at some of the facilities that they currently have and, and our role with respect to the financing, you look at the residency, you look at the engineering school uh, with Holland College, their wellness center, those are all state-of-the-art facilities that have helped put Prince Edward Island on the map for post-secondary institution in Canada. In addition to our legislation, uh, the university also has reporting requirements into a legislative component for the Maritime Provinces Higher Education Commission. This really focuses on quality assurance to make sure their programs are meeting the standards um, and to really protect the the student experience through the university. They do collect data with respect to satisfaction, graduate outcomes, some of the enrollment data that you'll see in our agreement as well. They have reporting requirements into the Maritime Provinces Higher Education Commission. This is an overview of the last um, six years of our core operating grant. So you would recall each uh, in the spring when our operating budget is tabled, the core operating grants are noted for our post-secondary institutions. You'll see this is kind of a summary since 2018, 2019, and what the percentage overall increase is. The core operating grant, so we would have um, a core operating grant for uh, UPEI, Holland College, College de Lille, really focuses in on key areas of people, places, and programs. The bulk of their operating budget would be comprised of staffing um, for their, their contracts, their, um, their program delivery of maintaining the, the programs and the support, and then their overall operating expenses to operate um, the university. It's certainly been in the media and talked about on a national perspective on if the core operating grants are keeping pace with the needs that exist in the university. And I know when we were um, speaking to the university in fall 2022-23, they had noted some concerns <coughs> with their cost of their um, contractual arrangements that they had um, and keeping pace with what their need is. So that operating budget for 22-23 would have been about 140 million for UPEI, 22, sorry, 22-23. 2324, their forecast was 163 million. And just, I, I'm, it, you know, the operating budgets for the university are posted online. They go through approval of their Board of Governors and their Senate, and their, uh, their operating budget, their forecast, what's leading to those cost categories is a public document which is available on their website. So the reporting requirements on their agreement, um, and you know we're aware there was some discussion around this. I, I, I want to start by saying the October 31st, 2024 reference allows the university to complete their calendar year for their students and meet their financial responsibilities for reporting. So it's six months, their year end goes until the end of April. The October reference is when their books have closed on the previous years. That's not the only reporting that they do to us. They do um, ongoing engagement and reporting on each of these categories. They would be nominal numbers, though, until their end of the year. So when you look at their student numbers, their ratios, some of these components, we would be getting ongoing updates throughout the year. The October 31st reference in the agreements would be when the books have closed and their financial statements are issued with all of these reporting requirements. So you can see five core areas, their board of governors, the number of seats, number of vacant seats, and then the declaration where they're in, in adherence to um, two pieces of legislation, the University Act 
and the Post-Secondary Institute Sexual Violence Prevention Act and the regs associated with those two acts. From students, we track full-time, part-time international students, and I know we spoke in a previous presentation around international student enrollments. Um, we do know that they're seeing an increase in both domestic and international students for 23-24. Um, they do also provide us with information on their admissions, retention, and graduate rates for each of those years. Staff and faculty, the number of permanent staff, faculty, term staff, faculty, student to instructor, ra instructor ratio, which is extremely important for us to support that student experience, that they're able to maintain um, strong ratios of student to instructor-led programs. The university has been involved in a number of research projects, um, and that would be, we would track information related to the funds that they do receive through the federal government and other research type of grants, the number of publications that they provide, and the applications submitted that, um, that they have submitted and that they've received funding for. Financial, we're tracking the scholarship expenditures as a percentage of their total, their revenues, and their um, spending per FT student. And again, reiterating that the province's position was important to try to limit the amount of increase on student tuition rates, which led to an increase in their core operating um, when you look at what the overall cost for administering post-secondary education is in Prince Edward Island. So those were the slides that we have to go through. Um, I think, Chair, we can open it up to sure. respond to questions. Sure, okay. Uh, thank you for, uh, for that, uh, going over that. Um, so I'll open the floor up to uh, questions from any members. Uh, Sydney? Thank you, Chair. And thank you so much for coming in. Um, so the, I want to talk about tie in the, the Ruben Thompson report. So like after that report came out, the province met with UPI uh, following the release of the report. And I think it was reported that UPI was expected to give the province updates on progress on the report. Can you talk to me what that looks like? Who's involved? How do those updates come back? You know, how are we checking on that from the province? So th thank you for the question. Uh, the Ruben Tomlinson report uh, was uh, released in June, and since that time there's been ongoing meetings and communications that we've had with the university. I, I do want to stress, um, you know, they are meeting their requirement of public-facing information. So if you check on their website, you will see um, the activities posted to date. They had released an expression of interest to ensure that the action plan developed to implement the Reuben Tomlinson recommendations is led by um, representation from the community at, at, at large, as well as staff having engagement. The union is represented around that table. So they've identified through a, a public call and expression of interest how that action plan is to be developed. They have a facilitator in place that's leading that work, and you can see online where they have weekly meetings that began the 1st of September. So as far as our um, reporting in with the university, I, you know, there's weekly engagement that's taking place. Um, they provide us with updates as to where the work is, and, and we are tracking through that timeline with them. Um, on the reports, and, and there is certainly a reporting requirement through to that. Sydney? Thank you. Um, and so thank you for, like, uh, I'm not sure if it was you that provided the agreement to, to our committee or not, but uh, appreciate the quick turnaround. Is there, is there actions from the Reuben Thompson report that would be tied to our funding agreement with UPEI, like, going forward? Yeah, so you'll see a reference in the Schedule A for the, um, for the legal agreement that does reference the legislative requirements. So, um, you know, the university has been very cooperative and, and showing leadership on this work. And, you know, it, the, the Schedule A does reference um, 
the project plan and progress reports on Ruben Tomlinson, and we would be updating and tracking that out on a weekly basis. So, um, yeah, it's noted in their financial agreement that we've signed with them under Schedule A, Section 2. Sydney? Thank you. And, and we're saying we in the province, like, is it is it your group specifically that that's the representative with UPI in, in dealing with this, getting those those updates? Like, there, to yeah. tell me, like, explain what that looks like. Kind Perfect. Of. Thanks for the question. And I, I think there's, there's multiple different structures that exist. So Aaron certainly would have a close relationship with the VP of... Um, academics and, and financial management. So there's work that happens at each level. Nicole and I would be um, with some of their VPs with respect to the new VP, which was a recommendation of the Ruben Tomlinson report for people and culture. I believe she's presenting um, to you at a later date. And our Deputy Minister, Natalie Mitten, has been engaged with the President since she began in her portfolio the 1st of September. Previous to that, it would have been our former Deputy Minister engaged with the President, uh, Aaron McGrath Goody. So we would have different um, levels of reporting and engagement that would be happening each week. Yeah, for now. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sydney, last question for now. And like you say, I know the report was, you know, was you know, released, just released, and you've just got these agreements in place. But how do how do you do you feel as as a government with the response from UPI? Like, is it progressing fast enough? Is it coming? Like, is it? What's your reaction to to the the setup that's in place now? So I can give you, I guess, my perspective on this file is coming to the file new, but I've been, um, I guess, around for for 25 years um, with respect to government delivery. I think, um, you know, they took ownership right away, which was really important to us. Um, they've committed to do the public interface to track out that progress and action plan, and they recognize that the action plan development needed to come from community stakeholders. So I, I think from, you know, the scenario happening is unfortunate and caused great concern for all of us, but the response to that, I would position, has been very transparent, accountable, and action orientated. Um, so I don't know, Aaron, if you want to... To add to that, I, I think, you know, um, we are very familiar with all of those recommendations in those reports, mm. um, and we track each of them with respect to activity and progress, um, but it's also important um, for the university to allow the work to happen at arm's length with representation from that broader community. So I think that's how I would position yeah, the only thing I could add, I think they want to do it right. They don't want to rush okay. through it. So I think they're uh, being efficient. But at the end of the day, they want to make sure they do it right the first time. So um, I think we're seeing that progress. And I think that will continue. Thanks, Sydney. Um, we'll move to Hal. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for coming in today for this presentation. Mary, in, in your presentation, you mentioned the provincial government's responsibilities. Um, were to administer funding agreements with post-secondary institutions. So my question is, why did UPEI go without a funding agreement for two years? Great question. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I think, you know, so th the Auditor General's report flagged that we were not compliant with Treasury Board guidelines and mm -hmm. policies. And over the years, we have we have three institutions in, in the province for post-secondary institution that are public that have core operating grants. At that time, you know, the core operating grants get approved each spring in the legislature, and there had been some, um, you know, letters confirming the amounts versus following the standardized contract. So what the Auditor General had flagged was we weren't following the most up-to-date Treasury Board legal agreement and contract. It's certainly, from, from the bureaucracy's perspective, we certainly had communications with the university and a firm understanding of what those core operating grants were, and they were tabled each spring in the legislature. So, um, you know, I, I think for us to talk about the why in the past, 
um, is difficult being in a former, it, it, it was a former department. I think what I can flag for you is when the Auditor General noted um, that there were deficiencies, we take it extremely serious in our department and we move very quickly. So if you look at the track through our approvals, post-secondary institutions do require both Treasury Board and Executive Council approval to have a formalized agreement. So when it was noted, uh, we did our work very quickly to make sure that we were going to be compliant with a legal agreement and started to progress through that approval process in 2023. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So was this common practice in the, in the past? I don't know if I would say common practice. I, I guess from my perspective, have I had mm -hmm. legal agreements previously where they may not have been compliant mm -hmm. that have been flagged from the Auditor General? That does happen. Um, you know, I, I, I think that common practice wouldn't be what I would suggest, but I, I think we identify risks and there certainly are some things, you know, when you look at the period of time that we were going through um, with respect to coming off of the pandemic, administering programs, changes in some of the infrastructure, contract negotiations. I, I think that we as bureaucrats assess risks and um, would we have flagged it as a risk to public sector funding? Not um, in particular. Um, but we did recognize that we needed to have the Treasury Board guidelines and policy contract in place. Yeah. Uh, thanks. And, and just to expand on that a little bit, because uh, government um, internal policy dictates that anything over $100,000 needs to have Treasury Board approval. Um, and this was $105 million that was given out without Treasury Board approval. Um, why was that not done? So the Treasury Board guidelines have actually changed to 250000 mm -hmm. for approval. So the $105 million that you're referencing would be with the three institutions in their core operating grant. And I, I do want to flag in, in April those operating grants did get tabled in the legislature by our department, mm -hmm. and that number is the number that was tabled and approved by the legislature in April. I, you know, I, I've, we identified that we had some deficiencies, and we've identified that we took it very seriously and moved to um, take the Auditor General's recommendations and to um, move forward for the approval process right away. Um, but you are correct, there, there were some deficiencies in early spring. Al? Um, so, th thanks, Chair. So, I guess, yes, we did pass, I should say we did, but uh, as a majority, it was passed in the legislature, uh, but there was no formal agreement signed. So, what measures moving forward are going to prevent that from happening again? So, you know, I, we take it very seriously with respect to meeting Treasury Board guidelines mm -hmm. and processes. And we, you know, our mandate letter talks about the department's desire, as is um, pretty well every organization that receives public funding right now, to move to long-term stable funding agreements. So that's in our mandate letter to move forward from this. Um, for, as department officials, are we now looking at additional um, elements of contract renewal and to ensure that we're compliant with all of the guidelines and policies. Yes, we are, and we'll we'll continue to do that. Great, uh, Peter. Thank you, Nicole, for being here. Um, I'm going to follow along the line of questioning that Hal just had regarding the agreement that from August of this year. Um, and as Hal pointed out, there was apparently no agreement for the previous two years and over $100 million of public funds were expended through post-secondary institutions. My first question is, uh, are you aware of agreements that existed prior to 2021? And if so, do they differ in any substantial way from the agreement that we have from August of this year? <coughs> So we are aware of some previous level of agreements. The changes, so the Treasury Board policy and guidelines 
continuously update some of the clauses in the legal agreement. So yes, I would be aware of different types of legal agreements that are signed. So, you know, if you looked back over the years, the legal agreement that we had at that time would be reflective of the risk, the insurance components, the, the liability pieces, and the directives approved under Treasury Board at that time. So there's some evolution of the clauses and the standardization of the legal agreement. The Schedule A would be reflective of key um, deliverables that we see within the contract for reporting. Peter? Uh, thanks, Chair. So uh, I've never seen uh, an agreement such as the one that we, we got after you know, a, lot, a lot of um, a lot of prodding to get that agreement that was uh, that was signed in, in August of this year. Uh, would it be possible for us to have copies of previous agreements so that we can make a comparison between the one we have now, the current agreement, and previous ones? So I apologize if you felt you had to prod to get the legal agreement. I think uh, the clerk would probably advise that we, we, we tried to get that to you within days. Um, as far as previous agreements, we would need to go back to the former department um, so I can follow up with that and, and come back to you. I do want to kind of reiterate that the Treasury Board guidelines and processes would have the contract components would be in place that would be standard over the years. The Schedule A would be reflective of the work that we're tracking through that term. So it, you know, it could, the wording would, would adjust based on that Treasury Board contract and what the requirements were at that time. So we can follow up and look at um, previous agreements that were in place and respond to you. Peter? Sure. Um, uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, maybe my wording was, was a little um, inflammatory, but I guess what I'm getting at here is it's really important that both students and faculty at the, the university and also taxpayers have confidence in our post-secondary institutions and that the money that we are, we are providing to these institutions in order that they can do their work and provide the education to students and, and um, and employ faculty um, is money well spent. And it's some time since we've had um, an audit, a performance audit of the university. There was one done in 1998, you would be aware of. Came back with 74 recommendations, very, very thorough report. Um, and it was the current Auditor General who flagged the fact that we don't, we did not have an agreement for a couple of years. And the reason I, I, I use that wording, and again, I, I wouldn't say I regret using that, but I, my point is it's really important that Islanders and everybody associated with the university and legislators here in this room um, have confidence in the money that, we're, that, that is being spent. And in order to do that, we need access to thorough, clear, transparent, comprehensive records. And I just as a legislator here, I have never been confident that we have had that. And from your, your department's perspective, um, are you comfortable, are you happy, are you uh, satisfied with the level of detail that you get from the University of Prince Edward Island regarding their financial reporting? Thank you for your question. I, I do think, you know, I, I just brought the core operating grant slide back up because I, I did reference that the operating budgets for the university are tabled, they go through their board of governors and their senate and they're tabled online. So the public confidence in where our investments are going, I do want to flag that, you know, the, the financial numbers noted, um, your reference to the legal agreement deficiency that we had over the two years shouldn't reflect concern on the uh, public investment and where that was going. So their core operating grant has been, is reflected. Their financial statements, um, they're one of the institutions in Canada where the university does provide their financial statements to the legislature on an annual basis. And we are aware 
of the pressures that they're facing from their contract negotiations and staffing. So, you, you know, your question with respect to it, do I feel that the information um, provided should give us confidence of um, minimizing the risk to public investment? Yes, I do. Do, do we feel, you know, um, as a bureaucracy that this was a step that was missed with respect to the actual contract in place? We acknowledge that that was a step that we missed and we're moving to correct it. So, you know, it, when you look at the university funding, I talked about the 160 million for 23-24, it's comprised primarily of people, places, and programs. We want to ensure the programs are effective to meet the student experience. We understand that the cost of salaries and maintaining um, support, there's pressures that our institutions are facing. And from a place, we want to make sure that they're a modern post-secondary institution that can attract the best and the brightest to come to our province because we see them staying here. So, um, you know, I we have work to do. We're well aware of that and, and we'll move forward from this. But I, I don't think from a public perspective of the investment, it is publicly available and goes through a process. If you read their operating budget for 23-24, they do spell out the pressures that have caused that increase for the 7.91%, and it's primarily through contract negotiations. Last one, Peter, for now. Thank you. So I'm going to dig down a little bit, Mary, on the operating budget and have that in front of me here. And um, it's a 20% increase from the previous year. And I know on the slide that you have up there, the core operating grant from government, the unrestricted spending is up by 7%. But that's still, in real terms, a long way away from the 20% increase in the operating grant. So in, in real terms, government is providing a smaller percentage of the operating grant than they were last year. And that's been a pattern for quite some time historically. I think we were as high as 50% of the funding of the university came from public funds. We're now down to 35% or so. So that's been a steady decrease, and it's a concern. You mentioned there that the pressures are primarily on um, staff costs. And that's where I find that we don't have a level of detail that I would personally be comfortable with. And it certainly doesn't compare with other jurisdictions where you will see very clearly um, universities reporting salaries, not just of faculty of, and staff, but also of administration. And that's something that we do not have access to here. Um, I'm, my question, and I'll, I'll get back on the list here. Um, sure. My question is, why do we not have access to the salaries of the upper level administration at University of Prince Edward Island as other universities provide publicly? Thank you for the question. Um, I think our role has been on providing oversight. Um, each of the uh, divisions within the university's operating budget, we would have a total of their salaries and the number of FTEs. Specific into individualized salaries, you're correct. We don't currently track individual salaries. Um, Post-secondary institutions do have some level of autonomy on their operating and a report through their Board of Governors and their Senate. As far as our role with tracking individual salaries, that hasn't been something that we looked at. But we will certainly, if you're flagging that that is the norm in other institutions across the country, then we'll certainly revisit that as we go into multi-year agreements. Thanks, Peter. Matthew? Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Thank you, Mary. Um, quick question, there are a couple of quick questions. Um, as far as the contract goes, you, you might have said, and I might have misunderstood, that uh, there, there, in previous years, um, it could have happened as well. Do you have any years those agreements might not, and you might not have that with you? I'm just wondering how long is... Yeah, I think we're going to have to report back on um, each year and, and what took place. I, I can tell you that we would have had... Every year there would be a standard letter that would have been issued that outlined the core operating components. Um, as far as which years had 
legal agreements versus not, we would need to report that back. Okay. Matthew? Uh, thank you, Chair. And final question. Just since the Auditor General's report com has come out, um, I'm sure you've dealt with the office now. Um, how has the auditor's response been, I guess, towards the department since the, the report come out and everything that the department has done since then? So, and I do think the, the Auditor General had reported back that if they did a review and they deemed that we were now in compliant, okay. uh, compliance with the 22-23 um, audit report. Um, so we've provided the information back and the updates and they did advise that we were in compliance. Okay, thank you. Okay, Matthew? All right. It's good, Chair. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you. Carla? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for, for coming in today. Um, <coughs> So in, in 2016, there were about 4,000 um, undergraduate students and 244 full-time permanent faculty with 25 term faculty. And then in 2022, we went to 5,300 undergrad students, 256 full-time permanent faculty, and 56 term faculty. So salaries went from 70 million in 2016 to 94 million, which is the change of, tr of 24 million. Yes. And with the addition of only 12 new um, permanent faculty, I'm wondering where this 24 million dollars, where that landed. So we may have to report back on the specifics to that. I, I do want to kind of flag, and, and this would certainly have been in, in the media as well through contract negotiations, there was also term staff that moved into permanent positions. There, so there was some casual conversion that took place. There were some additional teaching positions that were were included. There were changes when you look at their operating budget around increased costs with, for example, the medical school and the work that they're doing with Memorial University. There would have been some salary costs around those components. So we can, their operating budget does break down, Carla, each section and where the increases were. And we looked at those sections with respect to their total number of FTEs to see, you know, were they um, conversion type where they, where sessional instructors were, were getting additional positions or were they new hires? And we tracked that through. We can certainly provide some additional information on that. Carla? Thank you, Chair. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so I'm wondering, um, is government satisfied with the value for money that Islanders are getting with the public investment into UPEI right now? So we would rely, obviously that's not my area of expertise, but we rely on the Auditor General's um, uh, review with respect to public investments and and I think you know they did provide that we were in compliance with our existing contract I from previous work that I've done if they felt that there were areas where we continued to be deficient that would have been flagged for us um, so yes I do feel that we're in compliance and we are meeting those requirements. Carla? Thank you, Great. Chair. And so um, is this, I, I'm wondering how we measure this. So you said it kind of wasn't in your area, so maybe this isn't appropriate to ask you, but I'm wondering um, what, what do we use? Is it simply Auditor General um, advice that we go by, rules and policies, procedures, or is there something that, that we have as a government that kind of measures that we're meeting the goals that we, we have with this funding. So, <clears throat> sorry, my reference to not kind of in our direct responsibility was the value for money reference with financial administration of public investments and, and the, the um, Auditor General's role. With respect to, you know, we have the University Act that does outline the requirements we have you know, their operating budget, how we determine core, that would all be within the division's responsibility. So I do think you know, when you look at their core operating grant provided by the province with respect to their total operating budget, our area of responsibility is really in on the core operating, public investment, as well as the tuition components. And those would be two that we would um, be engaged in assessing, as well as some of their restricted funding agreements around their infrastructure, their borrowing costs, 
um, and some of the other smaller grants that were noted in the legislature. So, you know, do we feel like from our assessment was the 39 million that we had negotiated for the 23-24 agreement, did that make sense based on what we were facing um, with the university to have that accessible, affordable education for students? Yes, we do. Um, and I think that would be in line with pressures right across the country where institutions are talking about growing pressures of operating costs for post-secondary delivery in Canada. Last one, Carla. Yeah, for now. thanks, Chair. Yeah. Um, there was a lot. There's a lot to unpack in that answer. Um, so I'm wondering. Um, one of the th another issue that the Auditor General had flagged, kind of in general, um, in response to government, was that we don't have any evaluations attached to um, to funding, attached to to uh, projects or services. And so when it comes time to see, is is this effective? We're almost like running to catch you know the we didn't we're trying to run to catch up because there's no if we if that should be like our first step our first step should be what are our goals what are measurable outcomes what are we expecting you know and who's involved all of those different things when do we review and so do you have a process like that in place with these with these funding agreements so that there is a way to to measure um really concretely uh, the, this money? Like, do, do we have evaluation tools that, that you use? So, <clears throat> our role would be to measure the investment happening from public sector around our agreements. I, I did position, you know, the university has a $160 million budget and, and you, we've talked today about their core operating. So I do think, you know, the university does have some level of autonomy on their overall structure. Our role is to ensure that the core operating investment that we're talking about today does make sense and have the level of accountabilities and that's noted in Schedule A of our agreement. So, you know, it, the, we too did see the reference to the Auditor General uh, around evaluation piece and when you look at UPEI, they have, we talked about the Maritime Provinces higher education on their program delivery and the quality of education to make sure that they're meeting the standards and exceeding the standards in, in the Maritimes, as well as our core operating grants. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure if you can, maybe if you can give me a specific example of a project where we could walk through how we assess that. But I, I think, you know, they do have some level of autonomy with their Board of Governors and their Senate, which government's role is to appoint nine members to their Board of Governors. But there's also a level of autonomy here to make sure that they can operate and do their work while we're protecting public investments. So maybe, Carly, if you can give me an example, I can unpackage that a little bit, but I'm not 100% sure. Well, you're up. It's your limit here. If you have one, make it quick. Thanks. Well, I, I don't. I don't really have an example because the like the evaluation itself is kind of like whatever government's goal is with this funding, right? So it's kind of I'm just kind of asking about your evaluation process, not about like one specific goal. Um, so so maybe maybe that's something that we could have a little conversation about at some point to see. I'm just curious what your evaluation tool, if you have an evaluation tool, that goes along with this funding. Yeah, and maybe we can provide some information, but if you look, like, let's use the example of the design school for engineering. There would be a forecast of costs that would come in. They would come to the province and present, you know, what that project entailed, and they would be seeking a public investment on the deliverable of that project as well as authority to be able to borrow to build that project. And on each specific type of investment, we would need to look at what is the ask, what is the objective, what is our requirement within the department, and validate that on each step. So an evaluation with respect to a project versus what their, you know, uh, their core is primarily made up of the staffing and the the operating costs, which they do give a forecast and, and what that growth projection is out over the years based on their collective agreements. So it would depend on the activity, Carla, and the 
and what we were assessing as far as how we would respond and assess that requirement. Thank you. Um, Peter? Um, so I'm going to dig down a little bit more on the salary issues that we talked mainly, Mayor, because you mentioned that that's where the, the largest pressures on their, on their annual operating budget are. And if you look at the comparisons between 22-23 and 23-24, in most of the faculties, the staffing costs, and the majority of the spending here, of course, in, in the operating grant goes to staffing costs. It's, you know, Faculty of Arts, it was about 5%. Faculty of Engineering, about 8%. And some of the others are slightly higher, but none near the 20% increase in the operating grant of the university overall. But there are a couple of standouts that, um, that clearly show where the, the extra money has gone. One is the Faculty of Med Medicine, of course, um, not operational currently. Um, and there, was, there were, I think, 600,000 spent in the previous fiscal year um, on operational costs. And this year is $4 million. Um, and I'm wondering if you have a list. You mentioned that you went through that. You've specifically mentioned the Faculty of Medicine and the number of FTEs that that represents. And the, and the cost to the university. And this is, of course, a program that may not have students for another, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe that's my first question. Do you know when the first intake of students at the Faculty of Medicine? The, that program is to begin the fall of uh, 25 for the Faculty of Medicine. The first cohort of students should, uh, should be there in the fall of 2025. The one element just to, to flag with respect to, you know, your, your cost on salaries, the other components that happened is, you know, we put investments into the School of Nursing um, would be an example. So there could be some additional FTEs with that growth required additional instructional staff. So when I say we've assessed each category, we're looking at what the pressures were with respect to contract negotiations plus the mandate that we have to ensure that the university has the resources to produce the students that have been deemed significant labor shortages and we're trying to accelerate the number of RNs, for example, in the school. So they now have their accelerated nursing program, which would have led to additional staffing pressures from having that component in place. And I should just add to my prior comment that even though the school's not opening until 25, they have hired staff this year. So that, that increase you're seeing there, that 3.8, uh, it's, it's made up of the general wage increase, uh, increase as Mary noted, additional nursing and uh, additional uh, staff for the medical school. They, they've needed that staff now to prepare to open for 25. Sure. Just uh, Mary? I, you know, I know the university is going to be here presenting to you with specifics around their overall cost in, in salaries and other components. So I do think, you know, we do provide that uh, review and, and input into what we are providing as far as public sector investments. But I do think overall operational questions with respect to salary components really should be um, noted with the university when they're here. Peter? And, and that's fair. I absolutely agree, Mary. Um, the, a lot of this is unrestricted funding, and there you go, university, do, do as you feel is the most appropriate. But I still think, given that it's public funds, that the level of detail that we receive as legislators, as islanders, as a department that is funding this institution needs to be a lot higher. If you look at, in my previous round of questioning, I, I asked about details on salaries. If you look at what Dalhousie or UNB releases. It's a very, very detailed report on every faculty member and every admin staff. And we get nothing like that from UPEI. So I think it is, it's a fair request. And I, I'd love to know if there are other universities in Canada that do not provide that information. I'm not aware of any. And certainly our neighboring universities here in the Maritimes do provide that in very great detail. So I, uh, again, as a legislator looking to on for the efficient and effective spending of public funds and reasonable oversight on that, understanding that we do not want to interfere with the autonomy of the university. I get that. 
but I still think that we need that we deserve and, and should have more oversight. And that starts with the department that provides that funding. So I would really ask you to, to push further on that. Right. Going back to the, the salaries for the Faculty of Medicine, an understanding, of course, that a ton of work has to go in to that facility before, before it opens the door. Um, a lot of capital expense clearly being spent on that. Now you drive by on University Avenue, you can see how quickly that building has gone up. Um, but that's a significant expense, $4 million. That's more than the Faculty of Education. It's sim similar to the Faculty of Business and Engineering, and it hasn't even got going yet, and the salaries clearly will go up considerably. And I'm wondering whether you have, again, a breakdown. You mentioned, Mary, about some FTEs regarding the Faculty of Medicine. Do we know how many staff are currently working there? And again, going back to my um, trying to be a, a, legislature, a legislator who wants some, some fair oversight here if we have the, the salary levels of those people who are currently employed. So the 39 million core that we're talking about today is on the 160 million operating budget for the university. And, and if I had suggested that we don't have a firm understanding of that 39 million um, I apologize because we do. I think we've been able to tie in the 39 million with respect to contract negotiations and the percentage of overall staffing increases that were negotiated for their new collective agreement. And then as you had noted, some additional resources that went into the School of Medicine the, I believe that cost category would also include the expansion <coughs> at the School of Nursing with respect to, I'm looking at Aaron, mm -hmm. yeah. um, with the School of Nursing and the additional accelerated nursing program. So I, you know, if, if you're looking for some additional details on each component, we could certainly provide you some information as to what we have. Yeah, sure. Peter? Yeah, Mayor, I, uh, thank you for that, Mary. I do. I look at the Faculty of Nursing, and there's about a 40% increase there, so I assume that's actually separate from the Faculty of Medicine. I'm not sure, but again, that's the sort of details it would be really nice to have. The other sort of thing that stands out from the operating budget comparison between last year and this year is ancillary services. And my first question is what are ancillary services? That's under VP Academic and yep. Research. Yes, so it's yeah. on page 11 of the operating budget that you have in front of you, and, and it, those would be um, the things that they would would receive revenue on. For example, they noted a UPEI, or sorry, the 2023 Canada Winter Games, and the new residency, and some additional um, components that that bring in some level of revenue. I think the ABC would also be noted in in a revenue line under the that cost category. Last one for now, Peter. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm a little confused, Mary, because we're looking at the expenses here, the operating yeah. budget, not not the uh, not income lines. But so the ancillary services went from six million last year to eleven million, almost a, a doubling. Um, from one year to the other, and I'm wondering what those extra costs were related to. So if you look at on page 22, it does Don't note the actual operating budget under Appendix C. So the revenues were primarily, the revenues had increased on the resident services, which would include food, conference services, residence components, so that would be tied to the 2023 Canada Games, <coughs> and the expenditures would have increased to meet some of those requirements. Okay. okay. Right. Uh, Could you put me back on the okay, list? Okay, perfect. Mr. And uh, just, we have Carol on the list, and then we'll go back to Peter, too. We're trying to finish up, probably, I'm just starting to flag things a little bit, so mm -hmm. we're trying to get 10 after, a quarter after for a hard stop. Carol? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, NDAs. I'm going to switch switch gears a little bit. Um, we know that those are still legal when, even in cases of sexual assault and harassment, when the survivor um, would like that. I'm just wondering if should we be asking um, UPEI to report on the number of NDAs, general reasons for them, and and the payment amounts. 
<clears throat> Thank you for your question. I, you know, that certainly did come up in the Reuben Tomlinson report, and it's part of the updates that we're receiving. I, I think our position on this is they have an independent advisory group that are looking at those recommendations, and we feel it's important to allow that independent group to assess the recommendations and come back with a formal approach and then we would continue to give oversight into what those recommendations are. But we also felt it was important that we shouldn't be um, trying to make assessments on that until the independent group has reviewed the reports and has, has provided their recommendations. Thank you, Chair, and I think that's a that's a fair thing to to do. Um, does this agreement contain any money related to the settlement of of any of the NDAs? Our core operating yeah agreement. Um, not to our knowledge. Okay. Carla. Thank you, Chair. So, so do we know if any public? funds are being spent on NDA settlements? I think we would need to bring that back to you, Carla. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Carla, is that... Is that um, I guess uh, that kind of cuts off my next question. I'll wait to get that information. So. Okay. Um, so, perfect. So we'll move back to uh, Peter. Thanks, Chair. Um, I know after a, a, a lot of questioning in the House here and probably some public pressure as well, um, the, medic, the, the university embarked on a feasibility study for the medical school, and I'm wondering if you have, ha have, you, have you seen that? Is it complete? The medical school would have a <coughs> steering committee in place that is made up of a number of government officials. Our department would be represented, but infrastructure, you know, we would have transportation infrastructure staff, health PEI staff, and others um, who would be involved when the um, study had been completed. Peter? So uh, I'm uh, sorry. I'm, I didn't hear there, Mary, whether you've actually seen the study, whether you're aware of it, whether... I'm definitely aware. Have I seen the study? No, I haven't, but that would make sense being the role that I'm currently playing. I think what I can tell you is there would be a number of senior officials that would be represented around that table on the feasibility study, um, and it would have been uh, Nicole's predecessor who would have been represented up until that time. Okay. Peter? Thanks, Chair. I mean, there's a, a, a lot been going on at UPI over the last year. We had the, the strike. We, we had um, we lost the president. Uh, we had the Reuben Tomlinson report. Uh, we've had some large capital expenses, not just the medical school, which is underway, but the the new um, residency building on campus, and of course the the climate change building um, and faculty uh, out in St. Peter's. Um, large capital expenditures from an institution which is um, don't make it, universities don't make money that's not their purpose um, but we have incurred an awful lot of capital expenses at the university and I'm wondering whether how much oversight uh, particularly with um, the, the increasing costs in terms of interest rates of, related to those capital expenses whether there's any concern with government regarding the amount of indebtedness at the university currently. So thank you for your, your question. I think, you know, we take a lot of pride in the fact that our post-secondary institutions are innovative and modern and are looking to really attract the best and the brightest of the world. And, and you know, you reference a number of, of facilities and you're correct, those are, those are a cost. So every time the university does look at borrowing, then they do require an order in council with approval on that. Um, so we would be working with them on each of those project plans with respect to infrastructure, and the cost of borrowing would be taken into consideration. Uh, we do provide a letter giving the authority to the university, who I, I know would be looking for 
the best interest rates possible in order to um, proceed with that infrastructure development. Peter? Uh, again, I, um, I appreciate that, Mary. And uh, we, we saw in 2021 a Canadian university, Laurentian, uh, end up in severe financial trouble. And the auditors who, who, who provided the report on that said that it was largely as a result of uh, poorly planned capital expenditures. And also, a, another primary cause of that was administrative bloat, as they put it, and weak board and provincial oversight. And I'm just seeing, for me, um, some alarming parallels here between the situation in Laurentian, where they actually had to go into credit or protection, and the situation here at UPEI. And I'm not trying to be melodramatic about this, but I'm just trying to be a, a responsible legislator. And I would love to get a sense of confidence from the, from the government department, which is providing public funds to the university, that we have a level of oversight and that you are entirely confident that we are not repeating the problems that, were, uh, that we saw at another Canadian university that led them to lay off a couple of hundred faculty staff, drop a whole bunch of programs, 50 or 60 programs, I think it was, because we're all absolutely concerned about the viability and the future of this post-secondary institution. need a question, here. Peter? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, my question was in there, Chair. Okay. Uh, are you confident that we have a level of oversight to make sure that we do not repeat the problems that existed at Laurentian? So I've referenced a number of times people uh, places and programs and I, I think you know their financial statements do come to us we do feel we have the appropriate level of oversight given the province's role in the investment of the 30 million core funding going into the 160 million dollar operating we do feel with each of their infrastructure projects that they are following and and there's been orders of council um, issued for each of those projects where the university is um, making payments on all of those stated projects. If we had concerns, you know, your, your <coughs> reference to uh, Laurentian University, if we had concerns, then we would be changing our approach on those concerns. But we see the value in the university with their modern, innovative approach, and we can see that in their student enrollments. We want PEI students to see that opportunity here and the projects that you reference without those investments into capital we would be falling behind. So are we confident? Yes, we are confident um, with respect to their structure. If, if there are some areas where there needs to be more, then we would assess and, and request more. Um, yes, there are a number of projects and, and we're excited about those growth opportunities that exist for students here. Thank you, Mary. Sure. One more? We'll okay. Run All right, sure. Right. And, uh, I agree, Mary. I, I think in many respects the university has uh, has made some really um, progressive steps and is on the cutting edge in some some areas. And and those investments are, are are I'm not suggesting that that's a bad idea. I just want to make sure that there is financial oversight to make sure that they are indeed good investments. Um, my final question would be, and Carla asked about the presence of the. Uh, perhaps NDA payouts in the, in the operating costs here, and you said as far as you're aware, no. Um, I, I have a question regarding legal costs uh, related to the strike. With that, do we, do we have a sense of what those costs might be and where we would find that in the operating budget, if we would find it in the operating budget? So, that timeline of April 2024, I know our, our department, another division within our Department of Labor Relations would be engaged in um, determining a, 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 a resource with respect to the strike. So as far as their actual legal costs associated with it, um, I, we would need to get back to you on that. Okay. okay. Uh, Carla? Sure. Oh. Thank you, Chair. Um, we were just Googling the advisory, the, the independent advisory group, and I just want to confirm <coughs> that the, the group that you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. when we were talking about NDAs, and, and so is that the group 
that's, I guess, two part question. Is that the group led by Sarah Roach Lewis as a facilitator? And just for my own understanding, is their task to go through the Robin T Ruben Tomlinson report and, and report back on kind of the whole report in general, or are they specific? You're correct. Sarah Roach Lewis has been named the, the um, facilitator of the action group, and, and you would see where the university had a public call for interest and have representation on that group, plus there was a commitment made for union representation around that group. They are tasked with going through the Reuben Tomlinson report, the recommendations, and providing feedback through on what they feel would be the appropriate course of action to address those recommendations. Okay. Yep. That's a, a really powerhouse group of people on that advisory group as I read through the list. So I I agree. I think we were very pleased and it spoke to the commitment from the university to allow that process to unfold and to have that representation that we felt was comprehensive to give um, you know, the, the report and the recommendations um, that priority that it needed. Great. I just have a few to, to maybe end if that's okay. Um, uh, under the section conditions of agreement, uh, section 6C, it reads, UPEI before undertaking this agreement shall provide the government either with a certificate of good standing by the Workers' Compensation Board or written confirmation from the Workers' Compensation Board that such certificate is not required. Do you have that? We do. Okay. Um, the reason why I'm asking that is because the, the, PE, the PEI Faculty Association brought up two specific issues, one around ventilation, um, one around um, isolation during COVID. Uh, for international students in there that, that it, it didn't seem like it, it's a very, uh, it was an issue. So do you know of those and what are your, what are, what's the government thoughts about something like that? So I, I think the Reuben Tomlinson report had also flagged that there were some deficiencies with respect to um, workers' compensation and I know our department moved quickly to make sure that those had been addressed or to see where there was some um, non-compliance on some of the of the policies that were in place and and we do have communications back on file where the university was compliant so you know there are some areas where um, I think there was an interpretation and we sought clarity to ensure that those interpretations were being met so with respect to the the ventilation and the isolation piece during COVID, I know we would have consulted and um, taken action to ensure that there, there was uh, things addressed and that would have fallen with the workers' compensation group. Okay. Is that something, is that piece of correspondence something that you could share with the committee, the, the whatever you had back from workers' compensation and the dates and times and information there? I think we could look at that. Okay, um, just I'm trying to wrap up quickly here. So I've got two just different sections I want to just look at. Um, so in Schedule A, and we kind of talked about this before, but I just don't understand how this reads. Uh, could be me. Uh, UPL shall provide the following reports to government no later than October 31st, 2024. You mentioned that. Um, it's when the books close and stuff. But um, number two, governance. Uh, it, right away, it says a project plan. So about the Reuben Tomlinson report. But a project plan doesn't, it, it reads like you could actually have that project plan by October 31st, 2024 and be in compliance of this contract. That's how, that's how this reads. Is there a project plan right now? So Carla had mentioned kind of in her question with respect to things that are available online and an action plan developed. I think, you know, when we were preparing this agreement and the timeline, um, we would have started the preparation work for this in April 2024, the, or sorry, 2023. The Reuben Tomlinson report came out mid-June 2023, 
and we were at Treasury Board the first week of July in 2023. So I think, you know, with respect to the indicators, what I can tell you now on the Ruben Tomlinson report is, yes, there is a project template that we follow, but we also, um, we're, when we read through the report, we were putting our priority on that independence of level of expertise versus the university trying to move forward and address the recommendations that were, were noted. So um, the wording that we chose and we used in the schedule, you know, when we look at it today, would we have yeah. addressed some of that? Yes, we would have, but we were moving along through this process. What I can tell you coming to this file relatively new from another division is the university has been very responsive and wants to move forward from this. And all of the information that we have collected to date, like we know where they are on their notional components for their student enrollments and their international students. So those would be ongoing. The reference to the October 2024 is in reference to allowing the school year to close, the year end for the university to happen, and the timeline for their financial statements to be submitted for 23-24. Um, the reference to all of the other components would be ongoing every month and would be adjusted until we get to, would be adjusted and tracked until we get to the final mm -hmm. at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, but I would just think like you could have easily done that in a Schedule B year. You know, it just seems like it's too important because then too we have a motion here that was passed in the legislature that did say that we were expecting uh, we, 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 the motion was to, to government to, to make sure that we had the plan by September 6, 2023. And this doesn't re there, there is a few things that are, that, that are so, kind of a little bit. You know, I, I appreciate that, but we also, we were looking at the timeline and the work we were doing with the university and to suggest if we were to implement September 2023, it disrespected the independent facilitator that was hired and the meetings that started in September with that representation that really could speak to getting us the best results. So as Aaron had suggested, like we're trying to monitor risk and we're trying to also ensure that the university honors the system that's put in place mm -hmm. to get us to a better position mm -hmm. in PEI. And, and we feel very confident that the structure that they've put in place does have that arm's length and that representation that will get us to a better place. So we could have pushed September, we wanted it, but we saw the plan and the independence through that expression of interest that they were putting in place, and we felt that that was the best possible path to take. And yes, you, you referenced Schedule B. I, I think you know when you look at it on how we go forward with our agreements, we were trying to ensure we were compliant with Treasury Board. That's why we're here today, and, mm -hmm. and we can validate we were in compliant. We always look back and say, we could have done this, we should have done that, but you also have to meet the compliance and the timeline to protect public interest, and that was our priority when we were doing the agreement. Um, I think we're certainly taking copious notes in our three-year agreements where we need to look at adjustments for future to, to look at how we track. Yeah, okay, well thank you, thank you for that answer. And um, yeah, um, just, we could go on, but I mean, I just wanna move on to the, the last little bit here, just to make sure that the Auditor General, what, what was in his report, and that's where I'm gonna read from 910. Um, one thing we did not talk about, but I wanna get uh, your, your opinion on and, and some information. It says, um, the Auditor General says, while no funding agreement with Holland College has been in place over the last number of years, so we're talking about the same type of thing. We didn't talk about Holland College. When it says over the last number of years, I, I know that there, and I would assume there is a funding agreement in place such as this too. What does last number of years mean for Holland College? How long was that time frame? I think the last number of years with respect to Holland College is probably referring to our pandemic years. Um, I would need to go back, same as the university, to map out exactly what was in place. Um, but I, I, I think when we were looking at it with the, the AG, it was what were we signing with the university throughout 2020, 21, 
21, 22, throughout the pandemic years? So that's not a definite answer. So like they, they run in, in a year long time frame. So we're, we're talking about two years, three years? I think it, same as the university, we had measures in place. Were they treasury board contracts in place during those said times? We would need to report back on that. Okay. But we would have had measures in place that we as a bureaucracy felt were meeting the requirements mm -hmm. and um, noted some deficiencies where we've since corrected. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so in the bringbacks, we talked about the letters to UPEI as being during the times where there was no contract in place that, that you'd mentioned that there was letters in place, and I think a committee member talked about that. Um, would it be possible, if the committee so chooses, would it be possible to get that information for Holland College to the letters that were in place between government and that organization? Or do those exist? We will look at that, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, Right now, uh, we, we do have some bringbacks, and I want to make sure that, that, that we, we, we get them straight. Um, so Ryan is doing a good job of taking here, the, the, everything clicking here. So um, there are some definite things that we talked about maybe being able to bring back. Um, maybe um, the things that I have, public funds for NDA, uh, the letters from Holland College and potentially UPEI. Um, uh, can I pass it over to you, Ryan, before our, our guests leave for a quick? Is it sure. too much? Or yeah. <laughs> if, if, it, if we miss something, what we can do, uh, we can we'll get Ryan to review, and then we'll we'll bring it out to the to the <clears throat> to the committee. Is that is that okay, or how do you want to approach that? I just don't want to miss anything. Well, I can go through quickly what I've noted here. I'm not sure I captured everything, but. Uh, um, why don't we get to review yeah. after? Yeah. Which rather than do it on the fly. Exactly, here. yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot there. So I just want to make sure that the, the committee knows that, that we are we are on top of that. So um, at We're this time. free to request anything on the department at any given time. Sure. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. So I want to thank our guests. What we'll do is we'll take a short uh, maybe four minute recess to, to switch out five minutes then uh, five minute recess to <laughs> switch out but I want to thank our guests that was, that was great thank you Appreciate thank you thank you we're in recess
Okay, we'll bring it back. Um, I'd like to move on to section four. We're getting a briefing on PEI Housing Corporation's financial matters by the Department of Housing, Lands, and Communities. So I would like to welcome our guests. And what we'll do is um, uh, we're going to, if the, it's, it's up to the committee, but uh, there was a, just a discussion before about we can go through each section and, and ask questions then or that's the that's what we were discussing here so if the committee is okay with that i'll pause that doesn't mean your questions are excluded for the end of the presentation so um so we'll just pause and we'll we'll go slow there'll be some numbers numbers here so um so i'll pass it over to our guests to start the the, the presentation and um we'll see how it goes just introduce yourself or answer uh, everybody and then we can we can move on yeah. perfect thank you chair um by way of introduction, I think I know most of you, albeit in a different capacity, uh, Cheryl Painter, CEO of the Prince Edward Island Housing Corporation, for a grand total of about five and a half weeks now. Um, I have with me to my left uh, Jason Doyle, who is the Director of Housing Services. Uh, Jason takes care of the uh, operational and really the development side as of late. And to my right, Marguerite Middleton, who is our uh, CFO, also fairly new to the portfolio. Uh, we do have regrets from our Deputy Minister, uh, Jamie McDonald. She was called to another file, life of a Deputy Minister, I suppose. Uh, and we are responding to your request of July 14th of the financial matters of the PEI Housing Corporation. Uh, before we, uh, I guess, officially got underway, the chair asked about the status of our annual reports. And just to be uh, kind of crystal clear, what we're talking about here today is our last filed annual report, which is the 21-22 fiscal year. And you'll see direct excerpts of, of that. Um, and that being said, I think we can probably advance the slide and and get, get into it, sure. So this is the, uh, the letter of July 14th inviting us to appear, spoke specifically to um, the, the language in and around the audited financial statements of accounts receivable, grants, lease obligations, and contractual benefits. So if it does please the committee, we will go through these one at a time and we can either open up for inquiries or questions. Some are more complex than others after each section or that, as the chair said, doesn't preclude from um, backpedaling to prior sections once we get through. So with that uh, being said, I'm gonna start uh, and hand it over to Marguerite. The first topic being accounts receivable. So what we've presented um, here is the accounts receivable for the, the two years, as you would see printed in your annual report. Um, the largest, obviously the largest portion of that accounts receivable at the end of 22 was the accounts receivable from CMHC. There's a small amount uh, due from the family housing authorities and then general would simply be HST or maybe some small rent receivables. And of course, we have a, a small provision set up for doubtful accounts, and that's basically around our rent receivables. You can see uh, the next slide, we've simply broken down the different types of, of funding agreements we have with CMHC and the differing amounts that make up that full receivable up above. So we have three individual types of programs, I'll call them, with CMHC, and those are the, the receivables for each of those. Hard to make that? accounts receivable exciting, so we'll <laughs> move on. Oh, uh, is that where you ask questions? I think that's we can, do we, if you want to ask questions. Do, is, that where, is that a spot where, sure. Sure. Yeah. a break where we, <laughs> yep. so, um, uh, I'll open it up to uh, the floor for questions, uh, Carla. Um, so I'm just curious, it's just a quick question. With all of this money that we receive, obviously there's strings attached to that. And so how are we, how are we held to account to ensure that, we're, that those monies are spent in the way in which they were intended? 
I can take the first round if you want, Jason. Sure. Um, the CMHC, um, all of their funding comes with routine reporting requirements. So we submit our claim to CMHC, and they acknowledge it and, and basically approve it in principle. But then when that project is finished, we're required to have full audits on that. And when that audit is completed, that's when CMHC actually releases the funds to us. So there's always a, a sort of a lag, which is why this looks like a pretty big number, until we get those <coughs> audits completed and the funds come back. And just to note as well, so of the $13.9 million that was received well at the end of 2022, uh, $9 million of that was received during the fiscal year, so the cash came into the account in fiscal year 2023. Um, so those, the two programs that are at the top of the list there, the Investment and Affordable Agreement and Social Infrastructure Fund, those two um, ended sometime in 2017-18, in, uh, and we received that funding shortly thereafter um, for the 9.5 or so million dollars. Then the other piece of it is the National Housing Strategy Bilateral Agreement, which was uh, obviously the major uh, funding uh, avenue from the federal government. And um, that is a, a few years worth of receivable um, through the bilateral agreement. And there is uh, there's three separate streams of funding. One is referred to as PT priorities. The other is Canada Community Housing Initiative, and the third one is the bigger one is the Canada Housing Benefit, which is the, the so, uh, equivalent to our mobile rental voucher program. Um, so that is, uh, that is still in the works of getting the audits uh, completed for that bilateral agreement, so that's why it's still showing as receivable. But we, uh, we submit claims every year um, to accrue the funding with the federal government, and it's just a matter of getting the uh, annual audits completed to, to receive the dollars. Carla? Thank you, Chair. And so are all, have we ever been, um, like, have they ever said? Denied? Yeah. Money. Thank you. I'm trying Not to figure out how I word that. <laughs> Not to my knowledge. In yeah, so the uh, part of the national housing strategy was the development of an action plan by each province. Um, and um, as part of that action plan process, the federal government and the provincial government uh, agreed to the action plan prior to it being uh, uh, being published. Um, so that, that happened. So the development of the action plan happened for the first three years. And now we recently just uh, published our second action plan through the federal government bilateral agreement. So. Um, all of the targets, the uh, number of units being created, all of the different priorities have been established and agreed upon between the federal government and the provincial government. Thank you. Kyle? Anybody else? Peter? Thanks, Chair. Um, is there anywhere, and I'm just looking through all of the slides here, I don't see any mention at all of the rapid housing initiative. Is there funding that has flowed to the province through that program? So there's been there's been three rounds of rapid housing initiative. Um, we, uh, in the first round of, of uh, application process, um, we had provided support to a nonprofit organization to who received funding through the rapid one housing initiative round one. In round two, um, we partnered with CMHA, Canadian Mental Health Association, to, uh, to partner on their Fitzroy project through Rapid Housing Initiative. So we provided some uh, a forgivable loan and an operating grant to support that project that received federal government Rapid Housing Initiative funding. In, in round three, uh, we have been active in the Rapid Housing Initiative as well, where we have a partnership with uh, the city of Charlottetown through the city stream of the of the Rapid Housing Initiative, and we have, uh, so they received $5 million through that fund, um, and the City of Summerside as well received $5 million through that fund as well. Uh, they partnered with uh, the Boys and Girls Club in Summerside for a 24-unit uh, affordable housing complex. Uh, we provided a forgivable loan as well to that project to help cover the bit of the gap in the cost and the funding. Um, we also submitted an application uh, to the federal government through Rapid Housing Initiative Round 3, where we requested uh, $8 million in funding for one of our housing projects, uh, one of our construction projects. Unfortunately, we're, we were not successful in receiving receiving funding through that federal government under that initiative. Um, so that was a little disappointing, but we did, uh, we have received funding from the federal government um, by way of the city of Charlottetown, the city of Summerside, 
and the uh, Abbotwood First Nation also received funding through mm -hmm. the Rapid Housing Initiative, which we have supported as well, that project through the Community Housing Fund. Peter? Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks for that really detailed answer, Jason. I'm aware that the, the, typically one does enter into a partnership with, with another, whether it's a municipality or, the, or um, an indigenous group. Um, but the province was, as you just described, uh, it was possible for the province unilaterally and independently to make an application. Can mm -hmm. you tell us why that was denied? Did you get, were you given reasons by the federal government as to why that $8 million was not granted? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we had a very strong application that we submitted. Um, ultimately, when you look at the per capita contribution of the Rapid Housing Initiative funding, we received more money per capita for the island um, than we, on a, on a population basis. That we probably, uh, so we probably got a little bit more funding than we maybe should have during if you do it on a per capita basis. I don't have the specific details on why our application was not uh, was not successful. Um, but when I look at the, you know, the per capita contribution that the island received for the program, we're relatively happy with that. It was disappointing that we did not. We weren't, we're not unsuccessful with our application, but uh, when we looked at the per capita contribution by all of the other uh, funding partners, then uh, we're relatively happy with that. Okay. Peter? Chair. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just so I'm clear on that, Jason, I appreciate the detail. Um, so the, through the municipality, Summerside and Charlottetown, we were successful in gaining a substantial amount of money. Um, but is that program administered solely on a per capita? Like we have 0.5 of 1% of the national population. Yep. So is that program distributed? Because not all federal programs are. Sometimes there's a base level and then there's a bit above that. Is that how the RHI is distributed? Um, historically, when you look at the numbers, maybe I don't believe that uh, it is funded specifically on a per capita basis, so that's not you know the tagline Officially. of the program, um, <laughs> right. but when you look at the you know when you look at the history of the funding that we received, um, it is it does yield those results usually. Okay, chair. Peter, thanks, chair. Um, so you put in a um, a project worth eight million dollars that was sadly denied. Were there? Did yep. you make any other applications, or was that the only one that the province put forward? Uh, yeah, so we put, we put forward the one application for our particular program. Um, we worked with both the city of Summerside right. and the city of Charlottetown on their application process. So we are an official intermediary sure. partner with the city of Charlottetown. So we were heavily involved in the uh, submission of that application. And it is related to the funding received is related to one of our projects. So uh, our project on Malpec Road, which is an 82 unit building, um, that's the project that we partnered with the city of Charlottetown on. We are, we're also involved heavily with the discussions with the federal government on the city of Summerside's project because they have uh, identified a, a very valuable partner in the Boys and Girls Club up in Summerside, um, but we were also at the table discussing that part of their application as well, so we were heavily involved there. Um, on the other side, with the Abiquit First Nation approval through the Rapid Housing Initiative, um, we have funding that we have we have approved and committed to through the Community Housing Fund. So we were also heavily involved in the application that they submitted through Rapid Housing Initiative with the feds. Okay. Yeah. Getting a little bit close to uh, whether the answers or the questions, it's, it might be touching on policy. Um, so we're looking at that. At, sure. The, the accounts of the province. So, just wanted to remind members of sure. that. So, okay. great. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, hopefully, not skating too close to the line with this one, <laughs> Chair. But it's regarding the um, the parameters of the Rapid Housing Initiative. And I'm, you know, we like everywhere else in the country, we've had real issues with uh, housing precarity and a growing number of people who are housing insecure and indeed unhoused. And one of the benefits of the RHI was that it would, as the name suggests, it, it provides, because new builds, of course, come with all kinds of potential barriers and, and roadblocks and, and delays in, in coming to fruition, but the RHI was specifically designed to purchase existing structures, motels, things like that, and, and make the conversion so that you could actually provide public housing 
quickly and relatively easily. And I'm wondering um, whether any application was considered to purchase existing stock so that um, we could actually access those funds and provide the housing immediately. Yeah, it certainly was considered uh, as an option. I know there are certain uh, other jurisdictions that have uh, that have received funding through the rapid housing for exactly that, a conversion of a yeah. you know, some type of uh, commercial building or a hotel of some sort. And so that was definitely identified as a possible uh, possible avenue. Um, we chose a different avenue. I mean, we looked at a, a modular construction project on Malpec Road um, to be able to. Uh, have a bit more of a rapid uh, construction process. So um, the, the process through the federal government is, um, you know, it's a scoring system. Um, there's certain certain things that score higher. So when you go through your application process, you know, they look at the ability to construct quickly, whether or not you have the, you know, the land available currently, um, what type of construction process that you're, you're looking, whether it's traditional or modular. Um, Scoring for energy efficiency, accessibility, um, different targeted population groups, those types of things. So it is a, it is a pretty comprehensive scoring system um, that they use with the federal government. But um, yeah, so we did, just to circle back to your question there, we did uh, look at an opp opportunity for a, you know an acquisition and a conversion, um, but we chose to not proceed. Okay, Peter? Chair. I'm good. I'm good. Perfect. Um, I just have some questions on that section. So we're, we're here because of 10.21 uh, from the Auditor General. And uh, in his report, um, he said internal control issues were again identified relating to the timeliness of reporting. Uh, the Prince Edward Island Housing Corp is required to submit audited financial reports to the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation in order to receive funding in a timely manner. As of March 31st, 2022, the corporation was behind on submitting submission of these reports, resulting in approximately $12 million being withheld by CMHC. So he, the, the withheld is the important thing. Did we, I mean, the, those went through and we got them, but a timely manner and withheld, those two lines right there, were, were did we submit on time? Um, what, what would you say to that, that statement? Were we... Was it a process of thing you had to wait to submit, or? So the uh, in, in that particular year, that's referencing our in a investment and affordable housing agreement with the IAH and the Social Infrastructure Fund, the SIF. Um, so those the the reporting. I think we can acknowledge the annual reporting uh, from the housing corporation has been has been late over the last few years. So absolutely. Um, the process that we have with the federal government is a claim-based system. So, we in we input our claims into their in their system. So as soon as we input their claims and we work with them on the claims, they accrue the funds on their end. So, as long as we complete the annual audits um, within a, a reasonable time frame, um, they withhold the money until we get those annual audits completed. And then, as an example here, we got the money in 2023. Um, for those particular funds. Mm -hmm. When I asked the Auditor General when he was in and, and his staff, I asked what would be the, what was the, what did Housing Corp tell the auditors? And he said that it was, it was due to a lack of staff um, on, on the, in Housing Corp or in the department. Um, yep. was, is that statement accurate? Certainly before all of our time in the department, but I would say that uh, that's an accurate statement there's certainly resources uh, there's been some staff turnover um, just with the expansion of uh, of the housing uh, industry on PEI there's certainly been a uh, catch-up period to try and staff up appropriately and, and I think that's certainly a fair mm -hmm. yeah. fair comment yeah and I think if I can add, current state I think is probably what you're really asking uh, so our accounts for the year ended although we're presenting on the most recently uh, released annual report 21 mm -hmm. to March 2022 March 2023 is in the hopper this week financial statements to be finalized so the wheels are kind of back on the bus if I can leave you with that message yeah yeah, yeah. exactly because it, it's a little sorry it's a little bit of a when I hear that from the auditors and then I hear 
okay, we were on time and we got those things through. And in, in I'm reading from public accounts, I went through public accounts to see what public accounts said, which I think those numbers were up. Um, at the bottom, bottom it said, the corporation is expected to receive a portion of the accounts receivable from CMHC in the amount of approximately $9.8 million shortly after the issuances of these statements once the final report from IAH and SIF are submitted and approved by CMHC. So Correct and received. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So if I, I saw that in the public accounts and I said, my question was, did we submit on time? Even though I understand the delay now, I understand the process, did we, if, if it was big enough to put in the, in the public accounts of PEI, is was there a time gap and was there a time frame gap from the housing corp to allow that to happen? That's yes, I think Jason answered yeah. that earlier. There was yeah. a, a catch up period of, I think, at least two years worth of annual reporting done last year. Yeah, and then and the annual reporting is only one component of the sure. uh, piece for the CMHC funding. So um, you have the claim, claim that gets inputted in, and submitted. Um, there's progress reports that go along with it, and then there's uh, the annual report as well, yeah. and then the annual audits of the of the statements, yeah. or of the disbursements, sorry. Yeah. And just to be clear, in this book, when they, when they mentioned the reports, those are to IHF and the SIF, not the not the annual reports. Like, those, those are, we're talking about two different things here. The, yeah. The, the, the funding received... Uh, two CMHC programs. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's two CMHC programs that uh, exactly. we had outstanding receivable at the end of fiscal 2022 that was received in 2023. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Probably, I think, in the early part of 2023. Perfect. Great. Um, okay, so that's all. I just wanted to make sure I was specific just to make sure that we're in public accounts, so yep. that's the Auditor General statement and, yep. and what we found Thanks. here. So thank you. Um, are we okay? Uh, any other questions here, committee, or at this, this section? Great, thank you. Sure. Okay, so I'll run through the next few slides. So on this slide, um, you're looking at a table that outlines our, our housing grant program support over a 2021 to 2023 actuals um, and the 2024 budgeted numbers. So. Um, as you can see on the table, there's been a, an increase of uh, pretty significant increase since 2021. So we've looked at, uh, you know, the, the actual spend of the corporation in 2021 was 21.7 21 uh, million. Um, and we're looking at an annual operating budget on the grant side of things for 41 million. So I'll expand to this a little bit on the next slide, but ultimately this uh, represents grants that we that we uh, spend through the PI Housing Corporation, and it includes a combination of things, but support for individuals through our rental support programs and the home renovation program, um, support for community partners delivering important services on PEI, and then some support programs for developers to incentivize them to construct affordable housing units. So just to run through this slide here, so uh, firstly we have our uh, social housing programs um, and this uh, includes um, firstly I guess the government owned units that we currently have. So we have uh, approximately 1,200 uh, senior units across the island and 500 uh, family units across the island. So those are all uh, tenants of ours that are charged rent on a rent geared to income basis um, and following income thresholds that have been uh, uh, published by CMHC. So we use the core need income threshold uh, publication through CMHC and that uh, dictates our uh, eligibility criteria for the social housing program. Um, in addition to the government owned units, I should say actually also the 500 family units that we do have uh, in, in across the island, 460 of them are, are managed through the family housing authorities. Through across, there's nine family housing authorities across the island. Um, so those are managed uh, through, through those um, governing bodies. There is um, approximately 50, 40 or 50 family housing units that we, we currently operate under our program and our staff. 
Um, we also have, in addition to the government-owned units, we have rent supplement agreements with private building owners. So we have approximately uh, 410 uh, units uh, through the uh, through that program, um, and that is uh, essentially a, a head lease arrangement with the with a building owner where we lease the units and we uh, uh, select the tenants. We put our tenants in there and charge them a rent geared to income uh, model. Um, second, or the, the last component of uh, this social housing program is the mobile rental voucher program and the Canada Housing Benefit. So that is the uh, financial tool that we have to, uh, to provide a rent subsidy to individuals that are living in other, uh, other um, privately owned units uh, or nonprofit owned units, uh, depending on the situation. So we have uh, about 1,350 uh, mobile rental vouchers that are currently issued right now. And that fluctuates depending on the month, so people come in and out of the program on a monthly basis. Um, on the supportive housing programs that we have, so there's kind of three categories. The, the first is on uh, the emergency shelter piece. Um, so we provide funding. Uh, I guess, first of all, we do have our own government-operated uh, Park Street Emergency Shelter. It was a 50-bed uh, gender-inclusive overnight shelter. So we have that that's government-operated. We have uh, other funding arrangements with some of the uh, other community partners uh, across the island. Um, to speak of a few, there's uh, we have the Salvation Army that is currently operating the Bedford McDonald House. Um, they also off they also uh, operate the uh, Weymouth Street Transitional Housing Complex, Smith Lodge, and we have uh, an agreement with them to fund them to operate the shelter support line. So so. Moving on from that, so we also have a, a funding arrangement with the, the Adventure Group to uh, manage the operations of the Community Outreach Center. Um, we have uh, funding with the Bloom Blooming House Women's Shelter to, uh, to operate their, their women's shelter eight-bed facility. Uh, we have an, a funding arrangement with the Native Council of PEI up in Summerside for Winter Street Emergency Shelter. Um, so that's a, a relatively new new uh, shelter that was uh, opened over the last uh, eight or 12 months. Uh, we have funding allocated uh, for the Chief Mary Bernard Shelter in Lenox Island. Um, we have funding allocated uh, to the Boys and Girls Club in Summerside, uh, otherwise ref other referred to as uh, Lifehouse for their uh, women and children shelter in that area. And then on the outreach side, we have uh, funding allocated to Peers Alliance Group for street out outreach workers as well. Um, and then on the PEI Home Renovation Program, just uh, we have uh, four separate programs that currently exist. Um, and, the, and the whole goal and concept is to provide uh, funding to uh, eligible individuals to allow them to stay in their home longer. Um, so we have the PEI Home Repair Program. Um, and the seniors home repair program, which kind of are the same same kind of uh, tool, but one is uh, for individuals that are age 60 and over. Um, so those would be more structural type renovations to a home. We're talking roof uh, stuff like that. Um, we also have a program specifically for individuals with disabilities. So there's some additional funding available there. Um, and then the fourth piece is the seniors safe at home program, which is. Uh, more so, like the words say, to keep to keep a, a home safe. Um, so we're looking at accessibility improvements to that home. So it could be from a, you know, a, a ramp put in or uh, grab bars in the shower, those types of things. Um, the next one on the list is the home heating program. So that is uh, funded through our through PI Housing Corporation, um, and that is to provide financial assistance to eligible applicants uh, to cover us uh, the cost of heating fuel or heating costs. So um, over the last 12 months, we have increased the income thresholds under that program. Um, so right now, the single household uh, can receive, uh, that income threshold for a single household is 45,000, and that's, that's up from 35,000 in the previous year. Um, and then the family household of uh, more than one person would be 60,000, which that is up from 45,000 previously. We've also increased the amount of assistance uh, to an eligible household. So recently, we had recently, actually the last three or four years, it's increased uh, uh, multiple times over the last three years, but most recently it's gone from 1,000 to 1,200 per household. 
And the last one on the list is uh, funding available for uh, the development of affordable housing units. Um, so we have administered through PI Housing Corporation, we have the Affordable Housing Development Program. Um, and that program provides a forgivable loan to uh, uh, developers that are seeking to uh, put affordable housing units in their uh, privately built um, buildings. So we, we provide the one component is the forgivable loan where we offset the capital costs of the project, uh, but we also enter into a head lease arrangement for those units. So that's kind of where the, the rent supplement piece uh, comes into play. So um, for all of the uh, applicants or approved uh, um, private developers under that uh, program, we would enter into a head lease arrangement for those units and we would put our own social housing clients in there. So people that are currently on the registry would be pulled off of there and placed in those units and they would be charged a rent geared to income basis. The second component is the community housing fund, which is uh, kind of very similar to the affordable housing development program, but it's a, it's a partnership with Canadian Mental Health Association where we provide the funding to um, administer the program. Um, there's a six party governing committee that, uh, that reviews all the applications through that fund. Um, and like I said, it's similar in nature to the affordable housing development program where we provide a forgivable loan to offset the cost of construction of the building. Uh, but in this case, there is no head lease arrangement. So uh, the private developer or the nonprofit organization that's doing a, a housing project, um, they would choose the tenants for the building, uh, but they would have to follow certain income thresholds that, uh, that are put in place through their funding agreement. Um, so that's the slight difference through that program. And there's also a few other streams. It's not necessarily just for the construction piece. There's a building capacity component as well. So we've seen a lot of nonprofit organizations uh, seek some funding just to look, build capacity and also to provide, there's another stream for professional assistance. So um, getting, uh, getting some of the plans completed, some of those business plans, some of those uh, things are, that can be funded through the professional services component. Um, the last few, uh, the Municipal Infrastructure Fund and uh, the Attainable Housing Fund are currently not launched yet, so we're still in the, in the process of launching those, uh, those funds, um, but broadly the Municipal Infrastructure Fund is meant to reduce the cost of infrastructure, so water, sewer, road infrastructure, so we, we um, which we've partnered with the Federation of Municipalities on that fund, um, would provide some funding to a municipality and a developer to reduce the cost of the infrastructure and therefore uh, reducing the cost of the home to the end consumer. So, and the Attainable Housing Fund is, is something similar where we would, uh, and, and I won't get into too much detail because it hasn't been flushed out completely yet, but it is the same kind of concept where we provide some funding to, to a private developer um, and that it would reduce the cost of the construction of the unit. And it's geared towards home ownership opportunities as opposed to rental projects. And the last one on the list is the Housing Development Challenge Fund, which uh, is uh, administered through Finance PEI, um, and it's a low interest cost, high le higher leveraged financing opportunities for, for developers. Um, so we have uh, round one of that fund was $50 million, and that was uh, previously announced, but round two has recently been opened up and uh, actually closed. Um, so that uh, um, applications or approvals through the second round of that Housing Challenge Fund are, will happen shortly. So that might be a good spot to stop. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like committee, we could be here for hours here. That's every <laughs> program they have. So, um, Zach. Okay. Thanks. Very good. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just the question on the Salvation Home Heating Oil. I know you kind of mentioned some numbers with the thresholds expanding. So the 2022 actual of like a half a million dollars and then the unaudited uh, 2023, it's like six times that. Yep. Is that really just, can you maybe give me the breakdown of, some of that obviously would be the price of fuel, like the price of fuel has gone up substantially, but is it also just the, the number of people that are actually accessing it now? Both, yep. So they're like obviously when we inc increase the income threshold, the uh, amount of people that was more it was available to increase so there would be more more people eligible to be applying so when we did the numbers um 
you know, we looked at uh, like the possibility of uptake through the program with the changes in the income thresholds and then the amount. Um, and we, um, you know, it was going to be a significant increase. So the Salvation Army's contract uh, for home heating program is $12.6 million until the end of 2024. We've provided uh, $3 million at the, I believe, $3 million in 2023. Um, and we are, you know, in the midst of uh, dispersing more funds under that program. So they're tapped out kind of now. So the, they will be receiving more funds very shortly through that so they can continue to administer the program. But as we get into the winter, I'm expecting that the uptake uh, will also increase. So there will be likely another disbursement towards the, the winter months uh, through the home heating program to the Salvation Army. Okay. Yep. Zach? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. So the Salvation Army, so would you know how many clients actually use it or is that uh, controlled by the Salvation Army? No, we have that. We have that reported. I don't have it on me today, but we can bring that back. Okay. Yep. That'd be great. Thanks, Carla. Uh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Or am I allowed to continue? Yeah, or no, yeah, I can continue. We'll be back on the list. Yeah, continue for now, and we'll. Okay. We'll Thank you, Chair. Um, just with regards, I just have a very quick question with the mobile rental vouchers that you mentioned, where it's uh, thirteen hundred fifty, give or take. Like when you mentioned, there was a fluctuation. So there are actually clients that would be using mobile rental vouchers. And then their housing situation would change where they would no longer need it. Is that what you meant by the fluctuation? Uh, it could be, yeah. But also, um, in order to we, we complete annual rental reviews for all our, all of our clients, so there it could be a situation where they're no longer eligible under the income threshold. Okay. Or they move, they may move to a government-owned unit as well. Okay. And that would, yeah. So that would change where they are uh, placed in our programs. Yeah. Okay, and just one last sure, follow-up. Thank you, Chair. Um, so that thirteen fifty, uh, the mobile rental vouchers, is that broken up between the uh, mobile rental vouchers and the Canada, uh, Canadian Housing Benefit, or are they uh, it's a combination? The number of thirteen fifty would be a combination of the, of the two. and it's just uh, the way we we word it for the federal allocation okay. of the funding. But it, oh, ultimately, we have thir around thirteen hundred fifty issued today, either through the mobile rental voucher or Canada Housing Benefit. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Carla? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have a couple of clarification questions that, that I think are, are really important. When we say rent geared to income, are we talking about rental vouchers and rent supplements? Yep. Yep. So they would be paying, any client that we have would be 25% of their income. But there is a bit of a distinction that I'll make on the mobile rental voucher. So there is a cap on that uh, amount. So um, the caps vary depending on the bedroom count, but they're, if say if somebody had a department that was $1,300, they would pay 25% of their income, but if they maxed out the cap, they would have to, they would be responsible for the difference as well. Carla? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I mean, this might just be me, but I wish we would just use rent vouchers and rent supplements because when I hear rent geared to income, I think that the rent is set at, let's say, $600 a month, and that's what the person pays, but that's not actually what happens. It's like $1,200 a month, and the person may be, whatever the rental voucher may be, they pay $600, and the, then the rental voucher pays $600, so it artificially inflates our rent. So, so I, I wish we would kind of just call it what it was, because it, it just, to me, personally, and I might be the only one in the room who feels this way, it just feels a bit misleading when we say rent geared to income. Do you know what I mean? Well, that's more so on our, you know, the calculation of our staff internally when they, per, per, you know, they complete the calculation of the person's subsidy. Like it's based on them receiving 20, like them paying 25% of their income towards rent. Um, but like I said, there is the cap too on that program. So we've recently increased the, the mobile rental voucher cap last year to, you know, increase that level a bit. But, um, and we will continue to monitor monitored that as well and with potential increases in the future. Carla? Thank you, Chair. And how high, like when you look at these, I mean, we, rental vouchers and rent supplements are crucial. We know that. Um, I don't think that they should be our long-term solution, but it kind of seems like, like that's, that's what we're doing. Um, and if we look at year over year, I mean, those increase fairly substantially with a, um, I mean, a bit of a difference here. but. How much are we willing to spend on rent supplements? I mean, as we consider inflation and we consider the trends in which people are, the cost of living and all that stuff, how much are we willing to spend as a province on this? Big question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it wouldn't be our sole initiative towards this. I think you'll see all kinds of 
efforts across the whole housing continuum and spectrum. Um, we're doing what needs to be done right now. I agree with you. Uh, some of those big questions need to be answered. We're not to overuse the word unprecedented, but that's the climate that we're in right now. So I don't know that any of us can give you a definitive answer on how much the province can stomach in this line item. It is what it's needed right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, just to add to that, like we have, uh, you know, multiple things that we're doing in terms of uh, trying to increase the housing supply available mm -hmm. to social housing clients. And, and part of it is uh, constructing our own units. So, you know, having our own units available for uh, the increased demand from social housing clients. But I think there, you know, there is a component of partnering with private building owners as well that is important. Um, um, just... You know, I think we have a, a certain amount of projects that we can undertake from a capital budget perspective, but I think it's uh, it's also important that we do have a, a relationship with that private developer as well to utilize units for that purpose as well. Carla. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a whole lot to say to ask about that, but I know I'm getting into policy, so I'm going to leave that for, for another time. Um, so one of the things that came up uh, in the last assembly, whatever you call it, um, was that funding agreements or contracts with Bedford McDonald House, for example, where it was expected by the province that they would be offering harm reduction services, which, you know, it's that's their prerogative, but that's not what they offer. And so has that been, has that been remedied? Um... I think if, as part of the Salvation Army's contract, um, and I may not be the best person to speak to that just uh, with regards to you know, being here for the financial matters, but um, on in their contract, it, there is you know a reference in Schedule A about utilizing a harm reduction approach. Um, and I don't believe um, that we have seen them not in compliance with that. So... That was that we got into a very heated discussion about that at the, the committee meeting where we were talking about that. So I'm not going to go back there, but I, I guess I would say that, that I disagree with that, that statement. And um, so I'm going to move on. That's not, we're, I'll save that for later too. Um, the other question I have, so you mentioned about the contract with uh, the Adventure Group and the, the contract with Peers Alliance who are doing crucial work. Um, unfortunately, what the government of Prince Edward Island has decided to do is completely centralize services and at the detriment um, of, of the community in which I live and many of us live and work. And that is a shame and we know where the gaps are and we know where the issues are, yet I can't get anywhere with answers. So I'm hoping that maybe you could provide me with some here. So the contract with the adventure group and the contract with peers, do we have, and, and I, I feel like this is gonna be my new thing because the more I learn, the more shocking I find it, that part of our, our program policy development does not include the very first step to me should be, how are we gonna evaluate this program to make sure it's working? What are our short-term goals? What are our long-term goals? How do we know it's working? Who is involved in the review? How long is it gonna take? All of those things need to be a part of a, because how do we know where we're going? You know what I mean? How do we know we've got, we got there? And I would suggest that the community outreach center you know, in general, for our community is a complete disaster. Um, people are not getting the help they need. In fact, I would say people are getting sicker. There's more people accessing the services. Um, so I'm wondering what sort of evaluation process you have to fix this with, with the Adventure Group, with Peers Alliance. Might be is, a little it, bit impossible. But, but well, yeah, but it is whole in bunch. the con I'm wondering about <laughs> whole the whole evaluation bunch. and the contracts, you know, because yep. and maybe I am going into policy, and if I am, you that's are, okay. Okay. Just, I can yeah. save those questions for another time, but I need to ask them at every opportunity I get because it's such a mess. It really is. And we have to admit that before we can fix it. Sorry. I'll stop. It's up but to But I do get, have it, more questions. <laughs> we're gonna we're going to uh we're going to see what the guests, I mean, it is policy, so when, when we do policy, we try to kind of 
watch the line. So, yeah. I mean, if, if the guests want to comment, great. But, um, um, I can briefly just say that, like, obviously we have the agreement with the adventure group um, that outlines in their Schedule A of the work of that they they take on as part of their contract. Um, they're in compliant with all of their agreements uh, criteria in the Schedule A. They provide an evaluation report at the end of the fiscal year um, that we review. Um, I don't think that answers your question, but I think at least that that's what we do through our contract with the adventure group. Just a clarification question. That was a one-year contract up in April. Is there a yep. new signed agreement now? We're, we're working through that piece of it still. So there's um, no agreement. We've had uh, so in a holdover status, so that one-year agreement conditions continue to apply until we get a new signed agreement. So th there is an agreement in, in place as a holdover from the original. To answer your question more directly, we do not have a new signed agreement as yeah. of yet. Yeah. yeah. Chair. Uh, okay, Carla. Um, so I, I'm wondering about, so one of the things identified was the, uh, by the Auditor General was a sprinkler system for um, the emergency shelter units. I know that that tender went out, I can't remember, not that long ago, even though we had a very long time to look at that. I'm wondering if you could give us an update on, on that. Uh, the tender has been, the contract has been awarded and the work is underway. Currently? Like they're actually in the shelter putting it in as we speak? Uh, well, there's planning that needs to happen before. Like there's probably a couple weeks of planning and then the construction will happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter? Thank you, Chair. In the same uh, section of the, of the presentation, uh, you, there was some talk on the transitional housing, housing with support short and long term. And I'm wondering if you have anywhere in your department a sense of what the needs are, how many transitional units we need, and I realize that's a spectrum of that, mm. how many we need and are we short currently? Yes, yeah, so I, I think definitely we are recognizing the need for more supportive housing units. Um, we're, we're currently undertaking our housing strategy as well, so we're, we're working through a lot of those, like that piece of it, whether or not you know, X number of units of supportive housing would be required. Um, we do know that uh, we see full capacity at our emergency shelter uh, operations, both Park Street and uh, the majority of the funding um, for the emergency shelter operations as well. Um, so, you know, we have done the exercise of, uh, you know, identifying um, those individuals, some of those individuals that uh, may be ready for supportive housing options, um, and that will get factored into our capital budget as well, um, both on a purchasing side of things where we may, we may have an opportunity to buy uh, units that would be suitable for supportive housing, um, but also on the construction side as well in terms of building more supportive housing. We do have a, a project that's underway uh, to create 13 more supportive housing units on, by way of construction project on Wayman Street. So that was you know, previously announced and it's been in the planning stages and hopefully we'll, we'll uh, start construction very soon. Um, we've also increased our supportive housing units um, in Charlottetown as well. So we have just recently created eight more supportive housing beds in the Charlottetown area. Um, I think ultimately, Staff recognize the need for more supportive housing options for clients, um, and the, the variations of uh, the level of support for these individuals. Uh, obviously, that changes depending on the complexities of the individual. So, we're looking not only on the infrastructure side, but the the partnership side with some of the community partners as well to uh, potentially deliver the services for supportive housing. Peter. Thanks. You mentioned there, Jason, the housing strategy, which we were promised this summer, and I'm sad to say summer has passed in many respects, but when can we expect to see that housing strategy? It's in the final stages. Uh, Cheryl, you can speak to it if you like. Well, yes, it, it is, and part of that definition has kind of been the stumbling block, to be perfectly honest with you. It's a moving target across the whole spectrum. We know that we are short across the spectrum. 
specifically break, breaking that down amongst the uh, varying types of housing is has been a little bit of a stumbling block but I started out saying I was a brand new kid on the block here I'm five and a half weeks in so I'm probably slowing the progress of releasing that strategy right now but it, it's coming to a, a quick and, and rapid fire draft stage to go into public consultation there's been tons of great work um, done and right wrong or indifferent caretaker period slows all those things and we're, we're hoping to at least have a draft strategy this fall to answer your question. Great. Um, yeah, so we're, we just wanted to let the community know we have about 10 minutes because of the, there, there's another committee at 132. So, um, yeah, that's that's all the time we can provide. So we have Peter on the list and, and Carla, and then I have probably a few to, to, to do. Peter? Okay. okay. Um, Sorry, I'm, that will alter my yeah. approach here, I'm Chair. Um, I, and I understand. You didn't get through the presentation either, just so oh. I, there's a few well, more well, slides. Well, okay. Um, we need all right. Oh, there's, oh. there's a lot on. That's what I. That's what I meant when the slide came up. There's a lot. Yeah. On there. So you I asked. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. No, it's great. So I'll ask a high-level question because last week we had uh, representatives from the department in here telling us that the population growth strategy really isn't fully developed yet, and I'm wondering how much input your department had regarding the housing strategy, which is obviously influenced very heavily by population growth in the province here. Did you have input in the population growth strategy? Yeah, we did, and we have a, a individual on our steering committee for our strategy. There's, We, we are in step there. Okay. Here, um, uh, some question. specific questions. Uh, the affordable housing development program, uh, the forgivable loan for affordable units there, how many years does the unit have to remain affordable before it switches over to market price? Uh, so the program criteria that it currently exists is a minimum of 10 years, uh, up to 25 years. Um, but it, does, it doesn't flip over to market price on the end, like at that end period. They would have to follow IRAC's regulatory rules around, uh, around lease rates. So you would have to continue to follow that piece of it. So they couldn't just take the rental rate and flip it to uh, market. I did not know that. Thank you for that. Okay. Peter? A final question. The well, I'm uh, given yeah. time constraints. The Housing Development Challenge Fund. You mentioned that round one is complete. Did you say fifty million dollars? Uh, round one. Uh, it's a it's a loan based program. Yeah. So fifty million dollars was round one, and round two just uh, ended. Uh, the in up, or the intake process for round two just concluded. Okay, and is that also for fifty million dollars? Yes, yes. Yeah, correct. It is. Okay, and that's the total cost. That's not cost cost to government. That's how much money is being granted out through the loan? Loan, not a grant. Loaned. Yeah. Loaned out, Low yeah. interest loan. Right. So the cost to government in so that would be the reduction in the interest rate for the for the capital loan. We base. pay the spread. Right. And yeah. how much is? I just I'm just doing a terrible oh. job of chairing. I know. Well, no, I'm not jumping in. My I'm apologies. letting. <laughs> I'm sorry, in the uh, the recorders. <laughs> Peter. Right. And how how is? The, thank you, chair. How is that spread uh, calculated? Is it a, a, you know two percent less than market? Like what, what is it? Yeah, so they charge two percent to the client. We cover the differential from the finance PEI's typical lending and that differential. So they may lend it out at four or five percent traditionally. So we would cover the differential in that cost, and we have that in our operating budget for this year. And Maggie, I'm not uh, if you want to speak to the number that we have in the. Is it a million dollars or two point five million dollars? I think was the interest company. Yeah. All right, that's enough detail Great. for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Hilton. Um, just a quick question. Um, the attainable housing fund. What is that? Attainable housing fund. Yes. Um, so we have a partnership with Habitat for Humanity on that, okay. and I, like I mentioned previously, um, it is still in the in the phase of getting developed. So we're still working with Habitat for Humanity on the program parameters, but in general, uh, broadly, it's a program that was uh, earmarked to reduce the, it's a home ownership program as opposed to a rental program, so it would, it would be a capital assistance to a developer to construct housing units um, and then pass on that savings to the end consumer, so okay, the thanks. buyer of the home. Thank you. Hilton? Uh, Chair, thanks. Um, how, you know how close that would be? or? 
any idea how that's come? Like, yep, yeah. So we're we're getting towards the end. The program criteria have been drafted. Um, we have to go to cabinet to get authorization on the program guidelines, um, which will hopefully be within the next uh, few months. Okay. Hilton, great, that's perfect. So Carla has the next on the list, but we're going to let you finish the presentation. So okay. yeah, it shouldn't take long. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Don't do OCD is. <laughs> yeah, so the, the last slide here is um, just kind of going back to the letter that came to us was on lease obligations and contractual benefits. Um, so the first bullet there is related to uh, ultimately our obligation through the CMHC bilateral agreement is so the funding that comes through the national housing strategy, it's, it's a $40 million pot um, but it's cost matched so we pay 20 and the feds pay 20 so that's the obligation part in that note there uh, the second component is uh, for our lease agreements so some of the head lease agreements that we have with uh, with some of the private building owners or referred to as rent supplement agreements those get captured in the second bullet there where we have uh, lease agreements with private developers or private building owners where we lease some of their units um, and the third component is related to uh, get into the accounting of this actually a little bit, but the forgivable loan side of things. So we have forgivable loans that uh, we incur the ins expense when we spend the money. So if uh, a developer was uh, receiving a million dollars in a forgivable loan, we would expense that on our operating or income statement uh, at that time. This note disclosure is essentially spreading out the forgivable component of the loan. So the individual company has to adhere to their loan agreement and the restrictions of making sure that those uh, agreements are fulfilled and that the rental rate is, uh, is uh, the same as uh, was agreed upon in the agreement. Um, and this is just the accounting exercise of kind of amortizing that cost over a period of the term of the agreement. So it could be, a, like I mentioned earlier, it could be a minimum of a 10-year agreement, but it could go up to 25 years as well. So that's where that note disclosure comes in on the, on the financial statements. And that's it. Oh, great. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. That feels better. Um, thank you very much for that. And so we've got a few sh short questions i know this is uh this is a big file and a big topic and appreciate our guests for coming in so carla thank you i just have i just have one more question that may potentially lead to one more follow-up but the i'm back on the housing grant programs page and i'm looking at housing with support short, short term and long term can you explain to me what that means where those are located and how many people um we are supporting with these so the, the, difference, the difference between the short term, and that's kind of a different phrase that we started to use as opposed to like the transitional and supportive housing because there was a bit of confusion about the time period. So um, short term supports is, you know, individuals that are in a transition phase. So they may stay for 12 months or so. Um, on, this, on the long term supports, we kind of recognize that uh, some individuals may need supportive housing permanently. So um, in terms of... Uh, what we have available right now on transitional or, or long-term housing supports and short-term housing supports, um, we have the, the Smith Lodge, obviously that has the transitional housing with the Salvation Army, um, but in the future as we construct some of our, our other projects, um, they are likely toward be towards targeted towards individuals that need a long-term, possibly a permanent supportive housing option. Um, so we don't necessarily have uh, funding for any of those units as of today, but like our project that I mentioned on Wayman Street for our 13-unit building, that would follow that uh, philosophy or concept. Carla? I think I'm... How many people is that supporting roughly right now? The transition? Yeah. Uh, we have 18 beds. Uh, yeah, but, you know, the number of people would vary because people come in and, in and out and... and so it would vary depending on the, the circumstances. And that's one. Carla? That's across that's the province? Sure. That we have 18 transitional beds for the province? Yes, that's correct. But uh, I should say that the Lifehouse Group and the Boys and Girls Club is also constructing a 10-unit uh, 
support of our transitional housing complex that's underway, and uh, we have provided some operating funding support to that project, as, or we will be providing operating funding support to that project once uh, it is completed. Thank you. Right. Peter, quick one. Um, recognizing it's difficult to ask questions on this without crossing over sometimes into policy discussions, yeah. but I'm going to try and try and keep this to uh, management of public funds. Um, we know that we're going to need to build somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 units per year to keep up with the population growth, and I'm assuming that will be clearly reflected in the housing strategy, which hopefully we'll see this fall. Do you have any sense of what, how much of, of those two to 3,000, I'm going to say 2,000, but that's, that's not going to do it. We know it's going to be more than that, but we're not even close to that, practically speaking. How much of those 2,000 units will be um, funded uh, as a public component of those builds? Funded or built by the us? Well, let's say built then, uh, public funds. I'll say it's in consideration of capital budget now, so uh, I, I don't, if we have a next year's capital budget is... Yeah, speak to that. yeah. I think um, there'll be a there'll be a portion. So we have a large number, as you're probably all aware. We have a large number of construction projects currently on the go right now. So we have, you know, upwards of ten capital construction projects that are either in started construction in progress or in the planning stages. So there's there's some kind of bit of a catch up piece on our side of things to create more social housing units, which we're currently doing. Um, on the on the market housing side, that's I guess a number that I, I probably can't yeah. answer. Um, we know that certain things have spurred some increased construction over the last little bit. Just you know, with the the lower interest cost available through the housing challenge fund, you know, you're seeing we're seeing a large number of projects uh, getting approved through that. That is going to create a large number of units. The HST uh, rebate as well. That's another one that has kind of pushed some projects. Uh, past the, you know, a stalled phase and starting to move forward. So um, on the social housing side, on the PI Housing Corporation side, I think we're working on um, a data-driven tool that will allow us to uh, create um, or figure out exactly how many more units we need from a social housing perspective annually to keep up with the demand of both population growth and then the increased complexity of some of the, some of the target groups that we typically serve. I don't know if I answered your question exactly, but... Uh, well, two part, if I could. The capital component of that is under consideration now, which you'll all see in, in due course. And I think it, the registry number we can probably share is north of 500 um, sitting on our registry now, which we're actively working to lessen, not all by builds by us, but that's kind of the number that we're working on as the, the, the gap or the buildup that we're trying to, to lessen now. Peter? So we know that the federal government has um, seen the light, shall we say, and they're very actively and aggressively coming forward with funding and programs to get our national housing concerns under control. Hopefully it's nothing quick. I understand that there's no silver bullet here. But one of the big promises in uh, this government's uh, housing approach was going to be a rent to own um, and I again I realize we're talking policy here but uh, do we ha do you have any sense of how many um, units could be created through a program that is rent to own probably can't speak to that directly that program is uh, going to be administered through finance PEI we are kind of similar to the housing challenge fund where we're involved but uh, also we're, we're providing a uh, of interest cost differential again so like um, we would cover the the interest differential between where they are going to be lending that money out or in this case a rent to own program um, versus what they will charge the client so our particular interest or our particular piece of the rent to own program is to cover the interest cost of finance PEI. Yeah. If I could, that program is not launched yet. It went yeah. to public consultation just last week. So we're talking about program particulars that have not been um, approved as of yet. But that's the, the concept. Okay, here, one more quick one to okay, get to sure. here. Where should we be spending our tax dollars to get the biggest bang for the buck to improve the housing situation on PEI? That's policy. <laughs> 
It's both. Oh, okay, oh, okay, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, but it's a good question. Supply. Yeah. Yeah. Supply. supply. Yeah. Right yeah. now, supply yeah. across and anywhere in the continuum. Okay. Yeah. Um, we we had um, nine nine dash one one. I know you were here to talk about other things in in public accounts, but nine dash one one in in the Auditor General's report talked about UPEI and Holland College operating without funding agreements. We know that number is over two hundred fifty thousand dollars. What I, I I would like you to consider, or I'm asking you to bring back to this committee the the contracts that you have that are outstanding, with with other organizations that are over $250,000 because in section 13 and 19 of Treasury Board policy and procedures, that's what we talked about all morning. So I, I'd like you to maybe bring those back if you, if you could because um, so that we can, we can have a look at those if, if possible. Certainly. Would you agree that there are contracts that you have that are outstanding or not? That need a new agreement? Yes. I, I would. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So. And we're on the eve of some of those, okay. so okay. we can commit to giving that, that list now. Or, I mean, we're within week, two yeah. weeks of some of those being renewed, so okay. I turn it back. Maybe to just in, in writing or, or just maybe send them to us. Maybe and, when and they're scheduled. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, perfect. perfect. So. Um, okay, um, so I'm not, I appreciate the time and the and the uh, entertaining of us with the, with this because uh, well, we did get into a little little bit of policy, but it's so important for Islanders to hear that you're speaking. So um, at at this time, I'll uh, do we have a review of correspondence? No, just any new business. Okay, is there any new business from the committee at this time? Any new business? Okay, can I get a motion to adjourn? Carla Bernard, thank you, guests, thank you, committee members. This meeting is adjourned.